We've been talking about different uh, types of subjects that you might be interested in when you're looking for books. So uh, we talked about science fiction. We talked about um, historical fiction, um, realistic fiction, humor, animals. Um, and then we also talked about nonfiction. So the idea of what kinds of uh, subjects are you interested in? What kinds of stories do you like to read? And uh, from that, you probably also get authors. Uh, so another genre of fiction is adventure. And adventure is when the main character has um, some kind of crisis happen. Uh, either they have a, a conflict with themselves or they have a conflict with others or they have a conflict with nature. So um, it kind of talks about the problem and, uh, and through that, they have quite a few uh, close calls or narrow escapes or whatever. And then they finally end up uh, resolving the conflict and end up um, probably safe uh, in the types of books that you're reading. Um, one of them is called Extreme Adventures. And this is uh, Crocodile Attack. And uh, again, you can see where that would be kind of a main character against nature type of conflict. And um, there's a whole series of these. We, this is the one we have at Reach right now. Another series that you might be interested in is the Alex Ryder series. And uh, this particular one is called Point Blank. Blank. And uh, I think the first one that uh, the author wrote uh, Anthony Horowitz was um, Stormbreaker and again there are several Alex Ryder series and uh, so if you like again where we have an issue with uh, a conflict between characters usually Alex is being chased by people who want to harm him and so that adds a little bit of adventure to his life. Another older series that we've got in is Pirates, and this is um, four of the characters, and one of the characters has a found an old treasure map in his attic, and uh, he um, know this, knows that his house was built by Captain Kidd, and uh, the pirate uh, whose stolen treasure has been lost for centuries, and so they decide that they're going to use this map and find this treasure and in that uh, they end up with some more problems other than just trying to find out what the treasure is. So there's uh, I believe four in that series and we have all four in uh, the store right now. Uh, another wonderful adventure author is Gary Paulson and he writes lots of adventure stories and the one you're probably most familiar with would be Hatchet and that was followed by um, The River and then we have Brian's Winter and then the fourth one in that series is Brian's Return and so this is Brian having to uh, survive in nature by himself and so that's his conflict for his adventure. Another one we have is, uh, the, it has three of his in there, Escape from Fire Mountain, Hook'em Snotty, and Danger on Midnight River. And this is a really good deal because you get a three for one. And they're fairly short stories, but yet they hold your interest and you want to keep reading to find out what happens. Another one is The Ninth Ward. And this one almost won the Coretta Scott King Award for uh, Best Story. And this is uh, talking about this character um, and Katrina. Hurricane Katrina is coming to her uh, town, which happens to be New Orleans. And, of course, this is based on a true event in our history and how she uh, resolves that conflict and... Uh, protects herself and her family. Another one is Gordon Corman. He writes uh, several different series. This one happens to be called Island. And of course we have a shipwreck 
and we have these characters ending up on the island. And this particular one is called Shipwreck. And again, I want to say there are three in this series. And this is the one we have in right now. And it's a good deal that it's number one because that's usually the one you want to read first if you're reading a new series. Another one by Gordon Corman is Dive. And this one is called The Discovery. And this is based on a, a story of a event that happened way back in in time where a ship sank with a lot of treasure. And so this is the story of trying to find that ship and along with that would be finding the treasure. And again, three in this story and this is book one and called The Discovery. And then another one is called Escaping the Wave. This is written uh, by Peg Carrot and she is another good adventure uh, writer and then this talks about what happens when he goes on vacation and he uh, an earthquake hits the coastline and a fire starts in the hotel he's babysitting his sister and then we end up with a giant uh, tsunami which is a giant wave that comes uh, into land after a hurricane and how he manages to get through that situation uh, the one I want to read to you today is called Holes, and that's written by Louis Sackar, and uh, it won the Newbery Award, and that is for the very best story for kids. And uh, again, this doesn't have pictures, and you probably saw the movie, and I'll tell you that the book is way better than the movie. And uh, it starts with part one, you are entering camp. Green Lake. There is no camp at Camp Green Lake. There once was a very large lake here, the largest lake in Texas. That was over a hundred years ago. Now it is just a dry, flat wasteland. There used to be a town of Green Lake as well. The town shriveled and dried up along with the lake and the people who lived there. During the summer, the day daytime temperature hovers around 95 degrees in the shade if you can find any shade. There's not much shade in a big dry lake. The only trees are two old oaks on the eastern edge of the lake. A hammock is stretched between the two trees and a log cabin stands behind that. The campers are forbidden to lie in the hammock. It belongs to the warden. The warden owns the shade. Out on the rock, out on the lake, rattlesnakes and scorpions find shade under rocks and in the holes dug by the campers. Here's a good rule to remember about rattlesnakes and scorpions. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you, usually. Being bitten by a scorpion or even a rattlesnake is not the worst thing that can happen to you. You won't die, usually. Sometimes a camper will try to be bitten by a scorpion or even a small rattlesnake then he will get to spend a day or two recovering in his tent instead of having to dig a hole out on the lake. But you don't want to be bitten by a yellow spotted lizard. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. You will die a slow and painful death. Always. If you get bitten by a yellow spotted lizard, you might as well go into the shade of the oak trees and lie in the hammock. There is nothing anyone can do to you anymore. Chapter 2. The reader is probably asking, why would anyone go to Camp Green Lake? Most campers weren't given a choice. Camp Green Lake is a camp for bad boys. If you take a bad boy and make him dig a hole every day in the hot sun, it will turn him into a good boy. That was what some people thought. Stanley Yelnitz was given a choice. The, camp, the judge said, you may go to jail or you may go to Camp Green Lake. Stanley was from a poor family. He had never been to camp before. Chapter three. Stanley Yelnitz was the only passenger on the bus, not counting the driver or the guard. The guard sat next to the driver with his seat turned around facing Stanley. A rifle lay across his lap. Stanley was sitting about 10 rows back, handcuffed to his armrest. His backpack lay on the seat next to him, 
It contained his toothbrush, toothpaste, and a box of stationery his mother had given him. He'd promised to write to her at least once a week. He looked out the window, although there wasn't much to see, mostly fields of hay and cotton. He was on a long bus ride to nowhere. The bus wasn't air-conditioned, and the hot, heavy air was almost as stifling as the handcuffs. Stanley and his parents had tried to pretend that he was just going away to camp for a while, just like rich kids do. When Stanley was younger, he used to play with stuffed animals and pretend the animals were at camp. Camp fun and games, he called it. Sometimes he'd have them play soccer with a marble. Other times they'd run an obstacle course or go bungee jumping off a table tied to broken rubber bands. Now Stanley tried to pretend he was going to camp fun and games. Maybe he'd make some friends, he thought. At least he'd get to swim in the lake. He didn't have any friends at home. He was overweight, and the kids at his middle school often teased him about his size. Even his teachers sometimes made cruel comments without realizing it. On his last day of school, his math teacher, Mrs. Bell, taught ratios. As an example, she chose the heaviest kid in the class and the lightest kid in the class and had them weigh themselves. Stanley weighed three times as much as the other boy. Mrs. Bell wrote the ratio on the board, three to one, unaware of how much embarrassment she had caused both of them. Stanley was arrested later that day. He looked at the guard who sat slumped in his seat and wondered if he had fallen asleep. The guard was wearing sunglasses, so Stanley couldn't see his eyes. Stanley was not a bad kid. He was innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. He'd just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was all because of his no-good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. He smiled. It was a family joke. Whenever anything went wrong, they always blamed Stanley's no-good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. Supposedly, he had a great-great-grandfather who had stolen a pig from a one-legged gypsy, and she put a curse on him and all his descendants. Stanley and his parents didn't believe in curses, of course, but whenever anything went wrong, it felt good to be able to blame someone. Things went wrong a lot. They always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He looked out the window at the vast emptiness. He watched the rise and fall of a telephone wire. In his mind, he could hear his father's gruff voice softly singing to him. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was just a little bit softer. While the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon, if only, if only. It was a song his father used to sing to him. The melody was sweet and sad. But Stanley's favorite part was when his father would howl the word moon. The bus hit a small bump and the guard sat up instantly alert. Stanley's father was an inventor. To be a successful inventor, you need three things. Intelligence, perseverance, and just a little bit of luck. Stanley's father was smart and had a lot of perseverance. Once he started a project, he would work on it for years often going days without sleep. He just never had any luck. Every time an experiment failed, Stanley could hear him cursing his dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-grandfather. Stanley's father was also named Stanley Yelnitz. Stanley's father's full name was Stanley Yelnitz III. Our Stanley is Stanley Yelnitz IV. Everyone in his family had always liked the fact that Stanley Yelnitz was spelled the same frontward and backward, so they kept naming their son Stanley. Stanley was an only child, as was every other Stanley Yelnitz before him. All of them had something in common. Despite their awful luck, they always remained hopeful. As Stanley's father liked to say, I learned from failure. But perhaps that was part of the curse as well. If Stanley and his father weren't always hopeful, then it wouldn't hurt so much every time their hopes were crushed. Not every Stanley Yelnitz has been a failure, Stanley's mother often pointed out. Whenever Stanley or his father become so discouraged that they actually started to believe in the curse. The first Stanley Yelnitz, Stanley's great-grandfather, had made a fortune in the stock market. 
He couldn't have been too unlucky. At such times, she neglected to mention the bad luck that befell the first Stanley ailments. He lost his entire fortune when he was moving from New York to California. His stagecoach was robbed by the outlaw kissing Kate Barlow. If it weren't for that, Stanley's family would now be living in a mansion on a beach in California. Instead, they were crammed in a tiny apartment that smelled of burning rubber and whew, foot odor. If only, if only. The apartment smelled the way it did because Stanley's father was trying to invent a way to recycle old sneakers. The first person who finds a use for old sneakers, he said, will be a very rich man. It was this latest project that led to Stanley's arrest. The bus ride became increasingly bumpy because the road was no longer paved. Actually, Stanley had been impressed when he first found out that his great-grandfather was robbed by kissing Kate Barlow. True, he would have preferred living on the beach in California, but it was still kind of cool to have someone in your family robbed by a famous outlaw. Kate Barlow didn't actually kiss Stanley's great-grandfather. That would have been really cool, but she only kissed the men she killed. Instead, she robbed him and left him stranded in the middle of the desert. He was lucky to have survived, Stanley's mother was quick to point out. The bus was slowing down. The guard grunted as he stretched his arms. Welcome to Camp Green Lake, said the driver. Stanley looked out the dirty window. He couldn't see a lake and hardly anything was green. And that was his introduction to Camp Green Lake. And he proceeds to spend quite a bit of time there. And he makes a couple friends and spends a lot of time digging holes, like all the rest of the boys that are there. So quite the adventure and highly recommend it. Uh, he's an excellent author and this is an excellent book. Happy reading, 20 minutes a day or more. Keep up the good work. And don't forget, five free books every time you come into the Reach Bookstore per family. Okay, see you soon. Bye-bye.